looking for... Look, look, lady, lady, I'm rehearsing. If you don't mind, uh, uh, kindly close the door and run along. Oh, evidently I came into the wrong dressing room. I'm sorry, Mr. Hyatt. Hyatt? <laughs> oh, come in. Come in. <laughs> Actually, I'm, I'm Jack Benny, but it's a natural mistake. And if I'm not mistaken, you're Miss Arden, Eve, isn't it? It ain't Yasha. Oh. <laughs> but if you'll tell me where I can find Mr. Allen... Oh, please, we don't mention that name here. Now, I'll have to spray the room with sweet air all over it. <laughs> oh, Mr. Benny, perhaps I should explain. Steve, you should pardon the expression, Allen, starts his new show tonight, and I'm supposed to help him get it underway. Oh, oh Steve, Allen. Mm-hmm. Oh, Steve, yeah. Well, Dean Autry has the room across the hall. I think you'll find Steve Allen in the dressing room right next to it. That is, if Autry's horse is through using it. <laughs> Thanks very much. I'll borrow your sweet air and run along. Yeah. <laughs> Goodbye. Pardon me, but is this Steve Allen's dressing room? If you were half a man, I'd thrash you for that. <laughs> but I'm not half a man, I'm a woman. No help, please. I'll find out for myself. <laughs> now, what's the idea of barging into my room at this hour of the night without even knocking? Well, I could say the British are coming, but actually that isn't... Tell that to Steve Allen. He's dressing with Paul Revere's horse down the hall. <laughs> it's Gene Autry's horse, but thanks. That's the room I'm looking for. You can't miss it, Steve. There's a watering trough and a bucket of apples right outside the window. Uh-huh. Under the apple tree. Uh, there's a beautiful story behind that apple tree, honey. And if I ever get you behind that apple tree, I'll whisper it to you. <laughs> well, that's very interesting, Mr. Marks, but I You really can call don't... me Groucho. Then you can call me Eve. Then you can call me Adam, and let's get back to the apple tree. <laughs> must go now, Miss Mark. Goodbye, Groucho. You'll regret those words as long as you live. Let's see, maybe this is Steve's dressing room. It's the last one in this corridor. Pardon me, but... Oh, sorry. I'm looking for Steve Allen. I must be in the wrong dressing room. No, you're not. I'm just standing here in the corner so Audrey's horse can use the makeup table. <laughs> Television, you know. Uh, Miss Arden, may I present my roommate, Champion? Oh, how do you do? It's a pleasure to shake your hook. <laughs> but Steve, did I understand you to say he's your roommate? Yes, this dressing room is known as the one that's shared by Steve Allen and Champion. <laughs> I'm sorry, Champion and Steve Allen. <laughs> He's such a ham. Well, Steve, I certainly wish you luck on your first show. Well, thanks, Steve. I'll be going on the air any minute now. we better get down to the studio. Now, remember, Steve, the important thing is not to get nervous. Uh, yeah, I know. And don't start biting your fingernails. What do you mean, start? I've been biting them all day. You see my little finger? Yes. I used to be my big finger. <laughs> oh, here's the studio. Hey, we're right on time. Eve, you want to sit right here in the wings? I'll introduce you later in the show. The Steve Allen Show. <laughs> yes, it's the Steve Allen Show transcribed featuring Eileen Wilson, the music of Isaac and Mars, here's Willie Johnny Jacob, our special guest, Eve Arden, and here's the star of our show, Steve Allen. Thanks very much, and hello, everybody. Uh, to you elderly folks who are out for a nice, peaceful Sunday drive, listening to me in your cars and trying to relax, I'd like to say, Look out for that truck! <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a, as a new program, as I think somebody already mentioned. We're just sort of feeling our way along here. So if nothing happens for the first 13 weeks, don't get nervous, because... I'll be off the air by then. <laughs> but it really is nice to have so many well-wishers. Jack Benny blew me to a big send-off party at his house last night. And, oh, it was great. Jack was a swell host. Water flowed like champagne. <laughs> and I think 
way, many of my closest friends were there to honor me. Uh, Louis B. Mayer, Clark Gable, Daryl Zanuck, Gene Autry's horse, <laughs> Phil Harris. You know, I never saw Phil in better spirits. <laughs> or vice versa. Or vice versa. <laughs> Uh, of course, Eve Arden was there, too, looking as radiant as she did when we first met some years ago under rather uh, romantic circumstances, I might point out. It was in a shoe store. We were... <laughs> you got something against shoes? <laughs> Let me see your feet. You take off your left shoe. I'm serious. Just take it off. We'll have a prize for you later. Go. It'll... I'll make it worth your while. Go ahead. Just a uh-huh. Six toes. All right. <laughs> There's a reason for everything. I mean, the fella has got something against shoes. It's a bunion. Now then. <laughs> anyway, Eve Arden was at the party, looking as radiant as she did when we first met some years ago under rather romantic circumstances. It was in a shoe store, and we were in the adjoining seats. She took off her shoe, and, and I took off my shoe, and first thing I knew, we were holding feet. <laughs> but so much for romance. I'll just skip that and get on to something more important. See what I have. Yeah, here it is. Uh, baseball score just sizzled in over the wires. Wilkes-Barre Orioles, zero. Scranton Cleaners and Dyers, zero. It's all tied up going into extra innings. So keep tuned to this station. We'll interrupt this program whenever we get another score on that exciting game. Incidentally, it isn't necessary for you to react to any of this stuff. However, I suppose it's only fair to tell you that I do get paid by the laugh. That isn't, that isn't your problem. Well, let my grandmother worry about that. She's the one that needs the operation. <laughs> That's all right. It's comforting to know that Granny's laughing. Of course, without teeth. <laughs> She's there. There's no question about it. Well, let me see what interesting items we have in the newspaper. Here's a beauty hint. Cucumber juice massaged gently over the fingernails will improve their growth. However, cream cheese rubbed on a bald head <laughs> will not improve the cream cheese. <laughs> you know, I was listening to the radio this morning. I heard some very interesting uh, <laughs> musical commercials. If I can get to the piano here, I'll show you what I mean. Here's a haunting little thing I heard on one of the programs. There's a great deal of sentiment to it, and if I may change the mood, I'd like to show you what I mean. It goes something like this. My sweet, my sweet, it won't be long before my sweet falls, cause I'm gonna pursue her, and I'm gonna woo her, with a can of Chef Gabonza's meatballs. <laughs> Thanks, fellas. You were very exciting. Eileen Woods, come on over here. I think it's your turn now, huh? Listen, I guess everybody knows, but maybe there are three or four people who just got back from the North Pole and don't, that Eileen Woods had the lead. She was the she did the part of Cinderella in the motion picture Cinderella, right? That's right. Mm-hmm. You gonna sing something from the score tonight? No, no. I, I have an oldie that, that's being revived about now. Bewitched, bothered, and bewildered. I'll listen to all three of them. Here we are. I'm wild again, beguiled again, a simpering, whimpering child again, bewitched, bothered, and bewildered am I.
was beautiful. Well, let me see what we have in the mailbag tonight here. We had a card from a fellow in Chicago that says, uh, Dear Mr. Allen, what did you do before you worked in radio? Well, that's a pretty fair question. As a matter of fact, I worked in Chicago. I used to work for the telephone company back there a few years ago. It wasn't very hard work. I just did work about two afternoons a week during the summer. Pretty important job, though. I had my own office, and my own uh, desk, and my own special telephone. I just had one thing to do. When somebody would try to make a 10 cent call for a nickel, I used to pick up my phone and go. <laughs> well, there's no further score on that Scranton Wilkesbury game. Let me see now who else is here. Oh, of course. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I should like you to meet a very courageous young lady who braved the ridicule of the Upper Nielsen rating set by consenting to appear on this program tonight. The star of Amish Brooks, Eve Arden. Hello, Steve. Hello, Eve. Eve and Steve. <laughs> Sounds like a nice team for one of those morning programs, doesn't it? <laughs> and after tonight, it could happen to both of us. <laughs> But it really is swell of you to come to my premiere, Eve. How do you like my setup? Oh, it's just dandy. On the Armist Brooks show, my cast is sometimes predominantly female. Whereas with you and Johnny Jacobs and Ivan Dittmars and his boys, your cast is, well, it's so masculine. That's nice. <laughs> you like men, I gather? I like men anybody gathers. <laughs> Thank you, girls. <laughs> oh, we have one man with us tonight, Eve, who's ungatherable. He's a newlywed. Incidentally, he and his wife feel that they're facing a tremendous problem. You see, they, they both have motion picture ambitions, and they're wondering if two uh, separate careers might endanger the happiness of their marriage. To dispel the fears of these newlyweds, Eve, I'd like to uh, cite the case of two very dear friends of mine, top stars at the same studio. I won't mention any names, but when they were married, Hollywood thought they'd never have a normal life. So what happened? We take you inside the glitter and glamour of a Hollywood studio and into the dressing room of screen siren Mona Meadows. Her producer, Effer Vess's enthusiasm. Mona, wait till you read this script for your new picture. It's dynamite. It's, it's the biggest money-making film of the century. And for your co-star, we're very fortunate in securing the services of that popular matinee idol, Stephen Hartfinder. <laughs> That Hamble? <laughs> he turned down Cecil B. DeMille's last picture because they wouldn't let him play both Samson and Delilah. <laughs> if I'm to be in this picture, Sam, you'll have to get rid of Stephen Hartbinder. Well, that makes it rather awkward. He is your husband, you know. Oh, yes, I forgot. <laughs> I did have a memo on that somewhere. Well, the very least we can do is to cut his part down. Yes, when I spoke with him this morning, he suggested we cut your part down. Oh, that egomaniac. He's always tried to outdazzle me. At our wedding, he came down the aisle with a bigger bouquet than mine. <laughs> I've got to have a talk with you, Sam. Glad I caught you alone. But we're not alone, Steve. You remember your wife. Wife? Oh, yes. How are you, Mona? I never forget a face. <laughs> Dear Stephen. <laughs> Good to see you again, darling. I'm looking well. How have you been? <laughs> well, I'll just run along and leave you two lovebirds together. Bye, Mona. Bye, Steve. Goodbye, Bye. Sam. It's been ages since I've seen you, Stephen. Where are you living? At our house. <laughs> I'm in the North Wing, you know. You still in the South Wing? Yes, it's lovely there this time of the year. I opened the windows this morning and it was just beautiful. Sunshine streaming in. Sunshine? It's... It's snowing at my end. I, uh... I have expected you might drop by sometime to see your child. I have a child? Born in January. I suppose I should have sent you a note. <laughs> a child. <laughs> Interesting. What is it, a boy or an actress? A boy. Come to think of it, he has your eyes. Well, 
Does he have my hair? Yes, only it doesn't come off. <laughs> and uh, speaking of things that don't come off, about your part in this picture, Stephen. Oh, picture? Oh, yes, yes. Well, you know, I've been thinking lately, well, perhaps if we could uh, get together some night. How about tonight? That's fine. We'll meet in the living room at uh, 7.30. <laughs> what part of the living room? You'll find me. I'll drop little scraps of paper wherever I go. <laughs> It's me, darling. Oh, dear, Stephen. <laughs> uh, Celeste. Oh, oui, madame. Take Mr. Hartbinder's coat and hair, please. <laughs> you seem depressed, dear. Oh, can't help it. I I was listening to the radio driving home. Really? What's the news? Doesn't look good. Scranton and Wilkesboro are still tied up, nothing to nothing. <laughs> you know, I'm rather curious to see what my baby looks like. Seems to me you were uh, shooting a picture on location at that time. Yes, of course. With my leading man, Herman Fang Schleister, I was quite busy. <laughs> but uh, if you were busy on a picture, Mona, how could you... Have the baby? Oh, I didn't have the baby myself. <laughs> Mona. I adopted him. Oh. oh. When the dog died. <laughs> oh? I gave him your name. The dog? Oh, the baby. We had such fun romping together, and I used to love the way he'd jump on my lap and bark at me. The baby? No. The dog? No, Herman Fang Schleister. <laughs> He's so playful. Oh, but darling, let's just talk about you and me. Wouldn't you like that? Oh, I don't know. Then let's just talk about you. Very well. <laughs> Why now I'm winding up a romantic film with Lana Latour. Oh, and practically every scene she hurls herself into my arms, embraces me, and kisses me. <laughs> How I envy her. That's fine, but about my next picture... Well, now that you mention it, Mona, I, I did bring the script along. You see, I rewrote it a little and fixed up your part. Now, get this. When the picture opens, there I am on stage singing a medley of 27 great songs. Where am I? Well, you're in the audience. But for subtle dramatic effect, we don't show you. You see what I mean? Instead, we feel your presence. We, we sense your spirit. Look, can't I put on a white sheet and sing the harmony with you? <laughs> 27 songs. Oh, no, no, that's where I go into my dance, Mona. <laughs> but what about well, my... Well, finally, the camera sweeps out of the audience and moves down the aisle to your chair. Oh, and now they see me. Now you've gone. <laughs> you see, this scene is just loaded with pathos. Now, think of the emotions that run through the audience when they see that empty chair. Don't you get it? I think I've been getting it all along. <laughs> I keep looking out to the audience. The camera keeps showing that empty chair. I keep telling myself that you'll return. We get a close-up of the chair, and finally, sure enough, the curtain comes down, and you don't come back. <laughs> well, how do you like it so far? Well, from what you've told me, I'd like to try out for the part of the chair. <laughs> Stephen, I'm going to give Sam an ultimatum, and he'll see that your part is cut down to nothing. No, that's what you think, Dumpling. Dumpling? Why, Toodle, you haven't called me Dumpling since we were married. <laughs> and you... You called me Toodle. Oh, don't you realize what this means, Mona? We've been letting our silly careers blind us to the fact that we're still madly in love. Mona, my sweet, you may kiss me. <laughs> Oh, darling, let's forget the mad pencil of Hollywood and live for each other. Yes, everything will be just as it was. Tonight, we'll have an old-fashioned barbecue in the garden. And first, a moonlight dip in the pool, diving from the high board. You go dive in. I'll join you in a moment, too. Yes, yes. Uh, Hurry, Dumpling. Hello? Yeah, Mona, this is Sam. It's all settled, Sam. I'll be doing the picture alone. Without Steve? Come over for tennis tomorrow, and I'll tell you all about it. I'm on the high board, dear. Here I go. Ooh. Oh, a perfect swan dive. Oh, Sam, I'll see you tomorrow. Uh, just, just a minute, Mona. You said something about coming over for tennis. I didn't know you had a court. We have now.
now. This morning I had the swimming pool filled with concrete. <laughs> we haven't had time to dismantle the diving board yet. I'll see you tomorrow. Goodbye. Goodbye, Sam. <laughs> Why, Stephen, you're hurt. It's nothing. <laughs> Lucky I have thin skin. I can see you through my chest. <laughs> Give me that telephone. Why, who, who are you calling? The Culligan Soft Water Service. The water in that pool is murder. <laughs> Once again, here is Steve Allen. Well, thanks, John. That just about puts the ribbon around our little package of goodies for tonight. But before we tie the bow, I'd like again to express my sincere thanks to my very gracious neighbors, Jack Benny, Groucho Marx, and, of course, Eve Arden. Before you go, Eve... Yes, Steve? I, I know we've been kidding a good deal about money. However, we don't allow anyone to go away from here empty-handed. So, as you're walking out of here tonight, Eve, if you'll just look down in your hand... Yes? You'll find my hand. <laughs> Believe me, Steve, I wanted to be here tonight just for kicks. I loved every minute of it, and it's been great fun. Well, it's mighty decent of you, but I have figured out a way to repay you. I'll go on your program. Now you've spoiled everything. Good night, Steve. Be <laughs> wonderful. Well, folks, I'd hoped that we'd wind up the show in a blaze of glory, but the fates have intervened. That will spur us, Grant and Gamer, still tied up at the end of the... <laughs> the end of the 23rd inning, nothing to nothing. I'm afraid we'll have to go off the air with... Wait a minute, I, I got the flash. The game is over, folks. Yes, in the 24th inning, the Scranton Cleaners and Dyers have won the old ball game by a score of 87 to nothing. <laughs> now, wait a minute, here's the, here's the final line score. Scranton Cleaners and Dyers, 87 runs, two hits, no errors. <laughs> will spur Orioles... No runs, two hits, 87 errors. <laughs> Good night, everybody, and thanks a million. <laughs>